These are the streets in that small neighborhood of Satella Shores. That's just outside of Brunswick, Georgia, that Ahmad Arbery was jogging on in his final hours. And from those streets to the county courthouse, one of the star witnesses in this trial won't even be able to take the stand. It's the video, the cell phone video that shows the last moments of Ahmad Arbery's life. We continue our report tonight with Jean Casares. One of the most important witnesses of this trial is not going to be a human being on the stand, it's video. And that is going to be evidence. What we know about at this point, we know body cam of the officers. We know that Roddy Bryan, one of the defendants, actually shot the footage of the chase and the altercation, the violent interaction between Travis and Armad. When I first saw William Bryan's cell phone video, I honestly thought I was seeing a lynching. I saw a man running for his life, being chased by men with guns in a pickup truck, and then killed. It was absolutely shocking. And you have to wonder if that video had never come to light, whether or not we would really be seeing homicide charges right now. Remember, the officers came on the scene after the incident occurred. We, we have blood on the McMichaels. We have a dead body, which is Ahmaud Arbery. Now what we want to do is we want to piece together the chronology as to why, when it happened and why it happened. Do you know where you got shot at, man? Is he shot on the front side, too? OK, all right. It's not 24. I need to know if you were involved. Negative. It's going to be a black male, middle of the roadway. Looks like about mid-20s. <laughs> Choice. 136, go ahead and start this way, please. We see all three suspects on the body cam. McMichael states in the body cam footage that Arbery was seen going into this house multiple times. And if he saw it happen, he would have shot him himself. A female police officer told Travis they're going to let them go home and change so that he can get cleaned up. Travis in this video is pacing around and he makes the comment, this doesn't look good because he shot a man. I told him stop, stop, stop till he hit me. I had nothing to do. I had good, there's nothing else I can do. I got you. Dispatch 136. Like I said, we're gonna take some photos of you and then we'll let you get cleaned up. I know, I can only imagine, like I said, everything's gotta be done right. I know, I, I, okay. I, I want it done right. <laughs> I got you, so. This just doesn't look good. I mean, it just shot me. The female police officer responded with something that was truly shocking to me as an attorney. She said, trust me, I can understand that. Oh. Last, thing I've, last thing I've ever known what to do in my life. I, trust me, can truly Watch understand that. I'm playing with my kid, next thing you know this. By this time, I'm in the back of the truck. So the guy, I mean, he's looking dead at us, you know? I mean, he's like, from me to you. And he turns and he runs. Travis gets out with the damn shotgun and runs up there and, you know, he, I said, Travis, don't, don't shoot, don't do anything. The guy turns and comes at him and they start wrestling and Travis shoots him around the damn chest. He had no, the guy was trying to take the shotgun away from him. He's got it on video. Okay. All right, do me a favor, hang tight. Yeah, I ain't gonna let me go, uh, let me go. I would like to get his blood out. I, I rolled I understand him that. To, to, check the, to check his pulse. Yep. Or didn't roll him, I pulled his hand, hand out when he, he had his hand stuck up under his head. I pulled his arm out, and then I realized he didn't have anything in his hand, and saw that this, this ain't gonna last long. The chest cam footage from the police who responded to the scene shows a very casual interaction between these investigating officers, these responding police officers, and the McMichaels, especially Gregory McMichael, who of course is a former police officer. I was chief investigator with the DA's office for okay. 23 years, so I know what you gotta do. Yep. I, know, I know everything, you know. Yeah, we're just, we're, we're just, you know, take all the, our time. All the bases. And, exactly. Yeah, absolutely, I, we're, we're here to help. And it really goes towards that concept of the police officer's working personality, that, that idea of loyalty and brotherhood, that men in blue stick together. They're not asking a lot of deep questions. They're really just accepting everything that the witnesses say at face value. They're not prying too hard. And it really does make you wonder whether or not this case was tainted from the outset. We are going to take your clothes, but we're going to let you go home and get it changed. That's why I was trying to make sure how close no, it was. Absolutely, do it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right, let's, let's walk. You're okay, sir. This is 
like I said, I can only imagine. I hope I never have to understand what you feel right now. One of the most striking things about Ahmad Aubrey's death is that when the medical examiner made their ruling in this case, they listed his cause of death as a result of multiple, multiple gunshot wounds. And in his particular case, as played out on the video, you can see he's actually shot twice with a shotgun at close range. But I think one thing that is just striking in this autopsy report, because you hear about people getting shot and it's a bullet, this was a shotgun. And a shotgun doesn't operate with a bullet, it shoots with pellets, pellets that go through your whole body. And the autopsy report collected these pellets and they diagram where the pellets were in his body. Two of those shots were in his chest. They went through different parts of his lung. There was also a shot right above the palm of his hand. This denotes not only a struggle, especially that shot, but also the fact that Ahmad was trying to, to take the gun away. The autopsy report includes a number of abrasions, but specific to the gunshot wounds, it talks about buckshot under the skin. Many of us have heard of things such as defensive injuries. Uh, anybody that's watched any kind of forensic programming over the years. In this particular case, there's also a significant wound that's noted, a third one, uh, which is referred to by the forensic pathologist as a graze wound or a shotgun graze wound to the right wrist, almost as if the wrist is being raised. Now, we don't know if this was in a defensive posture or if in fact it was just kind of naturally reactive, if you will, maybe while he's in the throes of death, but we do know this, it's a gaping wound, uh, which caused literally an injury all the way down uh, to the bone in this particular case. In fact, uh, if, it, <coughs> to be honest with you, if I could've got a shot at the guy, I shot him myself. The Elder McMichael Gregory uh, has blood on his hands. You have a dead body there, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, and of course you have Travis McMichael covered in blood. He's the one who uh, engaged in the actual shooting, and the police uh, call it in, and there's no arrest made whatsoever until months later, as we now know, based upon public outrage and the release of a tape showing exactly what happened and the public being just mystified as to how it could happen in the manner in which it did. The reaction is one of shock, one of disgust, one of disdain, one of what are we doing, uh, one of did this need to happen. Ahmad Arbery went out for a jog and never made it home. Now, the three men accused of killing him face trial. And HLN is there with live coverage. The killing of Ahmad Arbery, the jogger murder trial. Special coverage on HLN.